Welcome to Castle of Spirits, episode number 17, The Amityville Horror. And uh, we have a new... uh, Denizen resident. Yeah, joining us for her first ever podcast episode. So you guys may hear some little clickety clacks, some snuffing, some chew toying there might be wicked growling there mi- hopefully there's no growling there might be an alligator squeak you know we adopted this is one of the reasons we haven't done an episode for a while we just adopted uh, a little over three weeks ago a three-year-old boxer american bulldog mix named freya and we are dead in love with her Yes, but love changes everything. Uh, yeah, and she's a little nervous about our podcast setup. When I dragged out the podcast table and microphones, she was like, uh, I'm out of here. And now she won't relax, so she's just kind of wandering around. So please forgive any little doggy sounds that you hear. She is a very welcome guest. Well, resident, a very welcome resident here in the castle. Yeah, and she's also the, the guard dog of the castle. And oh, she man. sounds like a monster. She, yeah. Do you, uh, have you guys ever seen that movie, um, Elvira, Elvira, Princess of the Dark? The scene, Mistress of the Dark. Mistress of the Dark. Did I say princess? How dare you call Elvira God, a princess? Lame. We should cut that and let me re say it. No, I'm leaving it there to shame you. <laughs> There's a scene in the movie where the bad guy comes to her house and the shadow for this monstrous dog appears at the top of the stairs barking like it's terrifying and he's like okay and he runs out and then her little poodle algonquin comes running down the stairs like he's a little tiny poodle little yappy thing that's kind of freya she's a little on the small side but her bark says that she's a little on the humongous side. So, yeah, she is chewing on a bone right now. I'm really excited today about this episode because I've been wanting to do uh, some something about the Amityville Horror ever since we decided to do a podcast. Yeah. Now, it's one of my favorite topics. I even think it says so on my bio. If yep, it's big I think enough, so. If it's big enough to mention in the bio, it's big enough to warn an entire show. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like most things that we really like a lot, um, I got kind of nervous about maybe doing an entire show about it because I lo- I I love this topic so much. Yeah, that I didn't want to mess it up. Yeah, you want to do it justice, and you don't want to say something dumb, and yeah, and I don't want to forget anything. So all of those things, I'm just going to go ahead and do. I'm going to forget things. I'm going to say <laughs> dumb things, and all that stuff. But um, yeah, and why am I so fascinated? You might ask with the I'm- Amityville Horror. I mean, I am asking, Vince, why are you so fascinated? But at the same time, it's kind of, you know, in the the zeitgeist, right? Why are we as humans so fascinated with this story? Because it's not just you. I guess not. I'm not one of those people who's going to go to Amityville and stand outside the house and take pictures. No, no, please. Friends, don't do that. You know... But I am. It's a private residence. Let's let's not go bug these poor people who live there. But I am one of those people that if I had the opportunity to to buy the house and live there, I totally would. You know, I don't know that I would. And the reason for that is simply the the looky loos and the trespassers and the weirdos that they must put up with on a regular basis. I wouldn't want to deal with that. Uh, I guess you got a point. I mean, I can imagine just living here in the castle. Mm -hmm. If we had a crowd of 30 people outside the castle walls. Trying to peel shingles off the house and we're asking to see Jody. Yeah, things like that. It would probably drive me crazy. (laughs) And I guess, you know, they can't just build a wall around the place. They probably have. I mean, I wouldn't want to live in a house surrounded by another wall. But anyway, what do you have on tap for us today with regards to the Amityville Horror? Well, first of all, to state that it is arguably the most famous haunted house in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say the most famous haunted house, it's not like... Right, it's air quotes around haunted. Yeah, but it is the most famous house in the world, which is reputed to have been haunted at one point. Right. I have a little history of the house, I can tell you. Please. It was built in 1927. 
I didn't realize it was that old. Well, yeah. I mean, it wasn't that old when all this stuff went down. Well, obviously, but, in the meantime, but I was yeah. thinking it was built in the 40s or something. No, and it's a five-bed, three-bath, three-story, 4,000-square-foot Dutch colonial. The original address, 112 Ocean Avenue. They changed it, but I'm not going to tell everybody. It's like the whole thing with like Greenland is, and Iceland. They changed the names to confuse it, people. Yeah, yeah. And it probably doesn't work, but no, you know. They, well, they also changed the windows to try and change the the, the look, look of the house. Yeah, the face it got rid of those like squinty eyes. They did, and they they ruined the aesthetic, if you ask me. But I, you know, I don't know what people were thinking making a house that looked like it had weird evil eyes staring out at the street. <laughs> it's anyway, just the style, the Dutch colonial style. I mean, and what's interesting is that that viewpoint is the side of the house. The side of the house faces the street. Yeah, the actual front door. Is turned, you know, it's turned sideways, and you know when you stare at that square on, it looks like a regular neat house. But yeah. of course, this is from nearly fifty years of of staring at that image mm-hmm. presented on movie posters, websites, what have you? Yeah, your nightmares, the back of your eyelids. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, up until nineteen hundred and seventy four, the house was just a house, right? Right. Um, the people who lived there were the DeFeo family. They moved in in 1965, and in November of 1974, November 13th to be precise, Ronnie DeFeo Jr., Mm -hmm. who's 23 years old at the time, killed his entire family with a gun. It wasn't Mm -hmm. a shotgun like it's been depicted in the movies. It was a A a 35 caliber rifle, Mm -hmm. and um, in order, he killed his parents, his dad, Ronald Sr., 43, his mother, Louise, who was 42. He killed his two brothers, Mark, who was 12, and John Matthew, who was nine, and then his two sisters, Dawn, who was 18, and Allison, who was 13. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about this story is that he shot all these people with a rifle, and the neighbors only reported hearing the family dog barking, mm-hmm. which I don't know, I guess. I mean, shrug. They talked about, you know, that you would have been able to hear that for blocks. But, I mean, I assume that means outside, inside, where it's padded by several walls. And then the walls of the houses that people are sleeping in. And it's the middle of the night, so most people are sleeping. It's Even if they do, even if it does, like, reach them, it's not going to be the sharp, loud report at that point. So they probably slept through it. You yeah. know, you know. I what, here's the thing. What I remember when watching the movie, I, I don't remember anybody actually saying this or presenting this in the movie as as a supposition or as a possibility. Mm-hmm. But it almost was implied that the evil in the house that caused Ron DeFeo Jr. to kill his family was also responsible for muffling the sounds oh, of the crimes that were happening. You know, boy. it's like kind of cocooning the house so this evil act can take place. And even the people in the house... Well, like cocooning th- reality, man. Well, maybe. Anyway. But what happened next was that Ron DeFeo Jr., he he cleaned up and he showered. And then he left his house. Like the, ne- the next day, he went to this bar. I thought it was like right then. No, because the killings were supposedly took place, they like think, 3:15. around 3.15 in the morning. That's yeah. That's the... You know, I don't, and I don't know how accurate. I think they're probably basing it on, you know, the coroner's report, but also, you know, hearing the family dog barking at a certain time. So they're like, right. oh. So the next day, you know, late enough so that the nearby bar was open, he comes running in there and he reportedly burst in, fell to his knees and saw his friend and said, Bobby, you've got to help me. Somebody killed my mother and father. Mm-hmm. So everybody goes running over there. They they call 911. And mm-hmm. and the rest is history. Policing takes its course. Right. It wasn't long for him to be arrested because it was very suspicious. Mm-hmm. The first thing he claimed was that it was a mob hit because mm-hmm. saying, you know, my, my father's connected with a mob, right. um, which is not something that's ever been proven. But then he later told police- I mean, they did name the house High Hopes. You know- Frank Sinatra fans aren't necessarily mobsters. <laughs> no, but I'm just I'm just pointing that out. Frankie Sinatra fans <laughs> are A-OK with us. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, after 
he said it was a mob hit to the police. He then later said, during questioning, quote, once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Mm, mm-hmm. So boom, he's he's booked. The trial began October 14th, 1975, almost a full year later. Mm. But Speedy it, justice. But it concluded November 21st, 1975. Oh, that's um, a really fast trial. Yeah, pretty fast. The defense attorney, William Weber, he claimed not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, of course. with Because DeFeo claimed voices told him to kill his family. So they, you know, that was the defense. But the, the, uh, the, the jury, the court didn't buy it. Mm-hmm. And DeFeo was found guilty of second-degree murder and given six consecutive life sentences. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on the crime, but I just wanted to, to give a little background. Mm-hmm. As far forward as 1986, DeFeo claimed that his sister Dawn, who was yeah. 18 at the time, was the one who killed their father. And then the distraught mother killed all of the children. Oh, I didn't hear that part. I thought it was just, yeah, that she killed everyone. And then he killed his mother. It's just a complete, you know, yeah, c- catastrophe of, of <laughs> yeah. And then in 1990, he changed his story to say that Dawn and an un- unknown assailant, who he never really got a good look at, killed the family, and that yeah. Ronnie killed Dawn by accident in a struggle over the rifle. Yeah, I roll. It just and it, that's the best he could come up with. In I guess at that time, it was about you know 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I mean, at that point, it really doesn't matter because he's run away in prison. So. Well, the, the story changed more and more over the decades, but you know, eventually Ronnie DeFeo died in prison mm-hmm. in March of 2021 at the age of 69. Mm-hmm. So that's how that all wrapped up. But now we're going to go back. We're going to take you back in time. To? To the months after the murders took place. Enter George Lutz and Kathy Lutz. Mm-hmm. They were married in July of 1975. He was 28. She was 29. Older women. (laughs) Contrary to what they look like in the photographs, they were in their 20s. Yeah, exactly. Kathy had three kids from a previous marriage. There was Daniel, nine, Christopher, seven, and Missy, who was five. They also, because, you know, here at the castle, we we like to throw the spotlight on the beasts in our lives, Mm -hmm. had a crossbreed Malamute Labrador named Harry. Oh, I love that we know Harry's name. Poor Harry. For everything that that was said, apparently Harry was a really... I I heard George Lutz once say, he was a really cool dog. Oh, that's so sweet. For what it's worth, George was a non-practicing Methodist and Kathy was a non-practicing Catholic. At the time. They got Catholic real fast, though, didn't they? I think I think they may have. <laughs> so they got married in July of 75. And then they went looking for a home together. They found the Amityville house in the summer of 75. They didn't move in until November, but they found it in the summer. And the house had been on the market ever since uh, the murders. It was on the market for 100000 reduced to ninety, And oh. the Lutzes offered eighty, and they... They sold the house. Wow. And, this, and I, I'm just mentioning this now because of something we'll talk mm-hmm. later. Both of them owned their own homes and they sold them. So each netted about $40,000 from the sale of their own homes. Mm-hmm. So they made the easy 20K down payment, moved into the house, took up residence on December 18th, 1975. The house still contained the DeFeo family furnishings. That's creepy. Which the Lutzes negotiated and bought at closing. For for a pretty good amount. And, mm-hmm. you know, like George Lutz said in a Art Bell interview back in the early 2000s, he said, you know, there was really nice furniture. There was nothing, you know, the yeah. mattresses had been taken away. There was no blood on the walls or anything. I thought there was. I thought they had to do some cleanup. That there was no blood still. No, it was, a, it was pristine. So apparently now once the Lutz family moves in, this is where stuff starts getting weird. As we know. But tell us all about it. As we all know, they began experiencing paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. A basic overview of the phenomenon included cats uh, (laughs) in the background. Who never stop yowling. Oh, no, that's our house. Yeah. That's our castle. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were cold spots throughout the house. I mean, I'm sitting in a cold spot right now. And we should take a look at that. Call a demonologist. 
There were unexplained sounds that woke the family up at night. Of course, we hear those all the time too. Mm Mm-hmm. That time we after we moved in, we heard somebody walking on the roof. It was a, a no, raccoon. No, you heard someone walking on the roof. I heard somebody sliding around in the crawl space under the house. Yeah, that that's that's unsettling. That was terrifying. And I'm and I wasn't here, right? Yeah, you were here. Oh. But I've never heard it since. So anyway, go ahead. So the Lutzes heard weird sounds at night. They had old style doors that had keyholes, and those keyholes were occasionally oozing like sticky black, like gelatinous epoxy like drips that would come out of the heat that they would come out of the keyholes. Cross. These were throughout the you know the second and third floors. Mm-hmm. You Where see the bedrooms were. You see some of this in the movie that was made in nineteen seventy nine. Mm-hmm. Um but you know, in that movie there was like black ooze coming from the walls, very very theatrical. Mm-hmm. What's talked about in the book, because I read the book when I was a kid. I, I saw the movie when I was a kid. I read the book again as a grown-up. And what's interesting about it is that the phenomenon that they report, even in the book, mm-hmm. was very, very, I wouldn't I want to say toned down, but it wasn't nearly as over-the-top yeah. and terrifying as... A little more realistic. Yeah. But it is still, it's kind of like... a. It's like the greatest hits of paranormal activity. Right. You know? Oh, what happens in a haunted house? All of it happened here. Right. But there are also weird things too. Like George- Ooh, ooh, my favorite one. When George said, this is probably what you were just going to say, that in the middle of the night, he would hear a sound downstairs that sounded like an orchestra tuning up. Right. I don't know why, but that is terrifying. That's so creepy. And that was what I was going to mention next. And what I think what's scary about that is that I've never heard of that before. No. And maybe that's why it's so scary because it's unique. And it would wake him up. He thought he said he thought it was a clock radio or something that went off. So he'd go downstairs and look around. And of course, the noise had stopped and nobody else in the family heard the sound either. Devil's advocate, though. I mean, it could have been like, I assume they had those old timey metal radiators. I guess it could have been something like that, you know. The yeah, they make weird noises. Steam or whatever going through that metal, but well, I remember when we lived at our previous house mm-hmm. some, I don't know, twenty years ago or so. Mm-hmm. Not long after we moved into our first house together, mm-hmm. I was waking up at like eight o'clock in the morning, maybe even earlier, seven o'clock in the morning on a weekday. Yeah, and I was hearing somebody playing drums. Oh yeah. And I was convinced that it was the guy next door and he was playing drums in his garage. Mm -hmm. But I never, because I'm weird, I never went over and said, hey, you play drums, you know? Yeah. Just to try to figure out or even to look in the garage to see if there were drums in there. But I was convinced. And I never heard it. I remember you saying it, but I never heard it. And it would wake me up every morning. And I thought that was really peculiar. It's a weird sound to hear. And, you know, of course... They weren't the only neighbors around us, but they were the closest ones yeah. to our bedroom. Yeah. I never figured out what that was. But yeah, hearing instruments, any kind of instruments when you're sleeping is not the coolest thing. Yeah. It's not that chill as the kids say. <laughs> so back to the paranormal activity at the Lutz house. George Lutz said that after the kids went to bed, they would hear people walking around upstairs. Uh, only to like run upstairs and tell the kids to go to sleep. They find the kids are asleep in their beds. Standard stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, it's an old house, an aging house. Yeah, that stuff can happen. George could never get warm enough. I mean, either can you. Vince is constantly, I, I made him a scarf recently. I'm not kidding. He goes around all day with the heater cranked in his hoodie with the hood up, the scarf around his neck. And sometimes he'll even take like his knit hat and put it on top of his head where his hood from his hoodie is already residing. So he's double hatted and sitting there talking about how cold he is. So I I don't think that never being able to warm up is a sign of demonic possession. It's unless Vince is demonically possessed and I just can't tell. He always smells like sulfur. Is that one of the signs? 
I think it is. Mm -hmm. Well, call a demonologist. I've said it once already. I'll say it again. <laughs> George Lutz also would wake up routinely at three fifteen in the morning, which is the time when the when the um, murders were supposed to have taken place. That that combined with the can't stay warm enough, mm -hmm. I have found myself saying many times in the past, I'm. I'm freezing to death, like like George effing Lutz. Yeah. Or I woke up, for me, for me, it's two o'clock. Yeah. I'm waking up every night at two o'clock, like George effing Lutz. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that happened this morning, too. Anyway, so I, I share some things in common, except I'm not 28. <laughs> I'm pretty sure George Lutz wasn't either. He looked like he was 45. Yeah, that's the way it was back then. Life was hard on a 28-year-old. Back in the <laughs> 60s and 70s, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, the one thing that I read in the book that really creeped me out was this: that Kathy reported feeling, the Kathy reported the feeling of being touched by an unseen person. Mm. When I read that in the book as a kid, it terrified me because what's the scariest thing that you can think about in a haunted house is to see a ghost, but you don't see it, but you feel it, like rubbing up against you or touching yeah. you. She she said that it felt like a woman coming up behind her and embracing her, mm -hmm. like in a loving sort of embrace. Mm -hmm. No, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. Another thing that uh, most people will be familiar with was that George witnessed Kathy's face taking the shape of an old crone, mm -hmm. basically aging 40 years. And usually this was when she was in a deep sleep and he'd see her and it, you know, he'd wake her up and she saw it too. It wasn't just that he saw this. She looked in the mirror and saw this herself. Oh, I don't remember hearing that. But I was going to say, I mean, you experienced the same thing pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> seeing your wife age into an old crone right before your eyes. It's called love and marriage. <laughs> it's called we've been married for 21 years. It's called going the long haul. <laughs> anyway, that phenomenon remained for several hours. Oh, in, wow. In the movie, you know, they show her face suddenly looks really wrinkly. And in the flash of a second, it's gone. Mm -hmm. No, it stayed for like four hours. Ooh, that's and creepy. I, yeah, that's something you you would think you'd go to the hospital, right? See, look, what's what's yeah, wrong with my yeah. wife? Well, she's 55 years old. No, she's, she's 29. She suddenly got progeria. I think exactly. Ah, another great hit from the Amityville Horror Haunting was that the daughter, Missy, had an imaginary friend called Jody. Ew, okay, now Jody creeps me out really bad. Why is that? Because that's, you know, a flying pig with glowing red eyes. I don't That's, know if anybody says she was flying. Yes, but, second story. But Jody, or rather <laughs> Missy, said that Jody was an angel who lived in her room and sometimes would take the shape of a pig. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that is talked about a lot. Uh, they They sort of depicted it in the Amityville Horror with glowing eyes outside mm -hmm. the window at night. Scary enough, but to say that it took the shape of a pig... Mm -hmm. was creepy. The Lutzes themselves tried to bless the house on their own twice. This is after the famous priest blessing. Oh, so three times total. That we will get to momentarily because that's one of the, that's like the, the, the clincher of this. But when the Lutzes tried to bless the house on their own, George Lutz said that they heard quote, a chorus of voices asking us to stop. Ooh, wow. Hey, that's creepier than any demonic get out voice, yeah, if you yeah. ask me. A chorus of voices. This guy had a way with words. And yeah. you know, that may play into this too. Well, I mean, we have an orchestra and a chorus. Somebody was musically minded there. Whether it was the ghosts or Satan or George himself, I don't know. The book describes, and the movie, the discovery of a red room in the basement that wasn't on the house plans. Yeah. And they couldn't figure out what it was used for. In the movie, I think they discovered it was like buried behind a wall of brick or something. Yeah, because wasn't there a scene where he was like trying to dig it out and he's like chopping bricks out of the wall and yeah, then and, the floor was blood or something. And their psychic friend or something came into the house and said it, you know, it was the passage to hell and her voice was all deep and creepy. It was one of the scariest scenes in the movie. Yeah. We're going to circle back to that room, right? We sure are. Okay. There was the incident where... The the son, Danny, his hands got injured 
mm. in the sewing room window mm-hmm. where where the window came down and closed on his on his little hands. Oh, and that gives me really bad shivers because the way that um, George Lutz described that, talking about how the kid's hands were completely flat, like pancaked. So this is not something that was even depicted in the movie. Yeah, and I guess they really couldn't because it would have looked dumb. Well, it no it. It gives me gross chills because that happens. So when my brother and I were little kids, um, I accidentally closed his hand. He was like, I don't know, three. He was young, maybe four. I accidentally closed his hand in the car door. Like that door latched. It was shut. And when my mom, when, or my mom, me, whatever, when the door finally opened, his hand came out, his hand was flat. Like, really? Yes. It happens. And his he did not get a broken bone. <laughs> I don't know how because I just remember seeing his hand flat and I don't know how I didn't pass out. So the description of his hand getting flat in that window just m- makes me grind my teeth because I know exactly what that looks like. Well, you'd think that that would mean like pulverized bone or something. I mean, you would. I slammed a child's hand in a car door and it got flat and he didn't have broken bones. He was fine. I did the same, only I was the child. <laughs> Yeah, and you have a scar to prove it. I sure do. Anyway. But unlike Danny Lutz and and your brother, um, I did break a bone and had to go to the hospital. Um, Daniel Lutz, once they were were going to take him to the hospital and then then miraculously the hand was – the hands were back to normal. But I thought they did take him to the hospital. They didn't take him to the hospital. Right, but he said they did. Who? George. Yes, and uh, he had said- We'll come back to it, I'm sure. Yeah, I guess we can come (laughs) back to that later. The Lutzes claimed to have discovered cloven hoof prints in the snow around their house on January 1st. I think deer are cloven. I'm just saying. I never thought about that before. No. I I believe that deer have cloven hooves. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Are there deer in that area? I mean, it's New York State. I'm pretty sure they have deer. And of course, there is the famous scene from the movie, which depicts the father that blesses the house, and he hears the demonic voice saying, Get out! And then again, you know, get out, but really, really loud and creepy. Mm -hmm. That priest was Father Mancuso in the movie, and in real life, he was Father Pecorero. And then wasn't he something different in the book, too? I yeah. feel like that guy's name keeps changing. Yeah, but that's one thing that people say, oh, this is not true because the name keeps changing. Well, they're, they're trying to, I can imagine they would be trying to protect the guy's identity. Mm. The interesting story there was that the father was George's friend, even though Kathy was Catholic. But mm-hmm. George met the father Pecorero dur- during the annulment process for his first marriage. And they became friends. And he called on father Pecorero to bless the house Essentially, what happened was that after the blessing on the house, George Lutz says that the father told him he was, quote, a bit uncomfortable in the upstairs back bedroom. Mm, mm-hmm. He didn't say, oh, my God, this house is infested with demons. <laughs> Somebody screamed, get out in my face and flies. Although, you know, I mean, if he had heard something like that, would you really want to tell somebody that on the first I day they moved maybe in? not. So there's there's something to be said there. Yeah, that's true. And this was also that sewing room where Danny's hand got caught in the window later mm-hmm. on. And this was also the, the bedroom of the boys. That lived oh, the there boys. Before, I yeah. thought it was Don's room. Okay. And so the father asked the Lutzes, what are you planning on use, using that room for? Mm-hmm. And Kathy said, you know, a sewing room. I just want to use it as a sewing room. And so the father said, okay, that's fine. I guess mm. he was going to suggest, don't make it a bedroom. Yeah. Because there's something creepy in there. So he basically got a creepy vibe. Yeah. And that's the extent of what was, what George Lutz recounted in this well-listened to interview that he did with Art Bell. A great interview. But a little frustrating too. We'll get into that. So as everybody knows, who's heard of the story, this went on for some time. How much time, Vince? 28 days. 28 months? No, 28 days. 28 weeks? 28 days. Days. As Lutz himself said, 
a full cycle of the moon. Oh, boy. So on January 14th, well, on January 13th, the night before uh, 1976, was their last night in the house. Mm -hmm. Of that night, George Lutz said, and I quote, on the last night we were there, I wasn't able to get up out of bed. Hmm. He says that despite contrary information on the weather we- on the weather record, there actually was an incredible storm going on outside of the house. That's something that depicted in the movie mm-hmm. and in the book. Mm-hmm. People have come and said later on, it, you can look on the record, there was no storm that night. Right. But he said, as far as we were concerned, there was an incredible storm going on outside of our house. I mean, it could have been like, what do they call it, a microburst or whatever. It could also have been, I mean, if you're in a haunted house and everything's going bananas, why not have the house feature some storm activity outside the windows too, you know? (laughs) Just just for ambiance. Right. According to George Lutz, the the boys' beds upstairs were being lifted up and slammed down. Mm. And he couldn't get out of bed to stop it or to see what was going on. Kathy was levitating off the bed and turning into an old woman. All this happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, I guess they barely slept through the night. They left around 4 p.m. the next day. Oh. Not like the movie where they run out in the middle of the night with (laughs) the house falling down around them. Man, I'm much more familiar with the movie than I thought. I feel like I've only seen the movie like twice and both times I was like, meh. But you know, it wasn't a great movie. It was great when I was a kid, but seeing as an uh, seeing it as an adult, it yeah, mm-hmm. you know. So the Lutzes took their family and went to stay at Kathy's mom's house, which is was about ten miles away. So it's not like they ran across country or you not know, like yet. like in Poltergeist and stayed at a, a motel. Actually, um, the way it's been depicted is that they left with just the clothes on their backs, but they actually packed some clothes. Their plan was to stay away from the house. Mm-hmm for a period of time to maybe let things calm down. And it was... Oh, so they had plans to go back when they left. Yes. Oh. That was always in the plans. The father, Father Pecorero, mm-hmm. told them, basically, what are you still doing in there? You need to get out of the house. You need to go somewhere else for a while. Mm-hmm. And he, he basically convinced them to go and told them, just take some clothes and blah, blah, blah. Probably thinking that... These guys are going to leave and they're not going to come back. But I I need to tell them something just to get them out of the house. He's not going to convince George to leave all his belongings. Yeah. And the kids leave their toys and all that stuff. However, their leaving the house was not the end of their experience. No, it wasn't. They claim that (laughs) that the phenomenon followed them. The levitation in bed by Kathy, Mm -hmm. began to include George as well. And this was happening at Kathy's mom's house after they left. They were both levitating off the bed, he says. Well, the family that levitates together. (laughs) Sorry. Ultimately, on August 30th, 1976, they, quote, returned the property to Columbia Savings and Loan. Mm -hmm. So I guess they they defaulted on their uh, Mm -hmm. mortgage. Which we will come back to. After the Lutzes left, George reached out to Ronnie DeFeo's defense attorney, William, William Weber, because they just experienced all this phenomenon and thought, well, this guy killed his family and said in the trial that he heard voices telling him to do it. So maybe this guy, you know, I mean, he's guilty, but maybe he, he shouldn't be in prison. Maybe he should be <laughs> exercised or maybe put in an insane asylum or something like that. Right. What was that noise? I don't know what that was. Well, we do have a couple of crazy cats. No, they're... He's back there. Uh, I don't know what that sound was. Is that back door locked? Is the castle... Have we drawn the moat for the evening? (laughs) That was my chair. Was it? Yes, that was my chair. I'm really creeped out now. It's the Amityville curse. I keep hearing sounds all over the house. And we're recording at night and it's dark out and we don't usually record this late at night. Anyway. The nighttime is the right time. The nighttime is the right time. Okay, go. All right. So George and Kathy contacted William Weber, DeFeo's defense attorney, to discuss the possibility of helping DeFeo because of the phenomenon that he that because that they had experienced. According to Weber, he and the Lutzes met up, but they 
started immediately talking about something else. They came up with the idea to write a book about their experiences as well as the trial of DeFeo. Yeah. Now, whose idea was this to write the book? It was an idea that the three of them reportedly came to together. Yeah, but I seem to remember hearing that it was the attorney who said, yeah, we should write a book. He was apparently, William Weber's, we, William Weber was apparently trying to cash in a little bit himself. He claimed, Weber claimed, that he and the Lutzes drank a lot of a lot of bottles of wine and came up with much of the plot that would be in the book that mm-hmm. was ultimately written by Jay Anson. Mm-hmm. And they effectively they parted ways. They never signed a contract with you know with each other. Mm-hmm. And George and Kathy uh, sold their story to uh, the book publisher, and they 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 wrote a book. Well, Jay Anson wrote the book mm-hmm. based on ten or twenty hours of audio tape recordings of the Lutzes, Mm -hmm. you know, telling of their experiences. Right. And the rest was history because the book, you know, became an instant bestseller. Um, They were on all kinds of talk shows. They were Mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, this was, that wouldn't happen today because you've got paranormal shows on every station. Yeah. How the travel channel ever ended up being the ghost channel, I'll never know. (laughs) But it is. Go to the Travel Channel, and those things are a dime a dozen. Back then, though, you know, and this was just a few years after The Exorcist came out. Yeah. And so kind of the appetite, especially the, the national appetite in America, was was really high for this kind of really creepy paranormal stuff. Yeah. And so it just, it was like lightning in a bottle, and it caught fire. That's a lot of metaphors right there. Yeah, I'm good for those. Anyway. I've got a whole bunch of them written down. <laughs> Great. Now, while all this is going on, and while the book is being worked on and written, on February, in February, and again in March, Ed and Lorraine Warren headed up two seance paranormal investigations at the house. Enter the Warrens. Dun, dun, dun. Although no paranormal activity was captured by film crews, the session yielded a photo of a boy peering out of a doorway. Oh, according, according to everyone present, there were no children there at the time. Some have suggested that the photo bears a likeness to the youngest DeFeo's son. Uh, I don't think it looks like him, but yeah, that photo is one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. Now, if they're there with the camera crew, the Warrens are there doing a seance, trying to cleanse the house. Mm-hmm. Who's to say that may not have been a staged photograph? I mean, it might be staged, but it's a child. I mean, I know I've heard, and I think you've said before too, that it was supposedly one of the crew members. I'm like, oh, so one of the crew members was sitting on the floor, like in a doorway, just randomly sitting on the floor in a doorway. And had become 10 years old And again. poked his head out. Right. And that is a child. When you look at the face, because children, their, their facial features, their nose, their lips, their eyes, those things are much larger on their faces than in adults, you know? And that person has the facial features of a child, the larger eyes, you know, and the smaller head structure. Right. So I mean I mean it could I mean, it could be it could be a staged photo, but that doesn't mean that it's not a creepy photo. And if you haven't seen this photo, we will put it in the Instagram post for this episode. So if you follow us on Instagram, Castle of Spirits uh, you can find it there. Or if you don't want to follow us for some weird reason, you can just Google Amityville boy ghost photo and it's right there. Why wouldn't they want to follow us? Are they, I mean, are they being some jerks? people are hurtful. Why do you guys do that? <laughs> what did I ever do to you? Don't do me like that. I quote Tom Petty. Yeah, and if I have that song stuck in my head tonight, we're going to have problems. Anyway, go ahead. So the rest is history, you know. The, what, okay, what I find interesting about the the Amityville horror is that no sooner had the book come out than people were saying, "Oh, this is a bunch of bullshit." Mm-hmm. 
These people are just in it for the money. The doubting of their story is not anything new. It's been happening for almost 50 years. Right. And you can understand that because there's something tacky about taking the death of a, of a family, a tragic death of a family, and maybe making money out of it. Oh, I mean, there's something tacky about it. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. Anyway, is this the part where we get to talk about the the conspiracy theories and whether or not we believe any of the stories? Yes. Okay, because this is my jam. This is what I'm here for. Well, just to to wrap it up. Okay. They they had a really popular book, mm-hmm. a really popular movie. Mm-hmm. It was a blockbuster. And I want you to guess how many movies have been made, not sequels, right? Because, you know, that's different. These don't qualify, but how many movies have been made? How many movies are in the franchise? With the Amityville name in it. I'm going to guess there are seven. As of 2021, there have been 27 horror movies bearing (laughs) the Amityville name. (laughs) What? The poor town, those poor people. Right? And no wonder you see the you see the word Amityville and you're like, ooh. Yeah. Also, I'm sure that it doesn't help that Jaws took place oh, in, yeah. on Amity Island, right? So that place was, you know, the name it, Amity was It doomed was primed for disaster. Because now, even without the Amityville horror, I would think of killer sharks on the beach. Yeah. Don't, if you're going to go to Amityville, don't get near the water. Not the same place, obviously, but you know. So, uh, yeah, twenty-seven movies. I've wow. seen. I've seen three of them, and one of them was and Rift that's Tracks. Too many. One of them was Rift oh, Tracks. Oh so yeah, that, 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 Rift, that doesn't really. Is that count. Amityville Three with Patty Duke? Um, it's not three. Isn't it? Is it three? I want to say it's part three, three or four. Anyway, it's got Patty Duke. I saw Amityville. It doesn't even take place in New York State. No. <laughs> let alone in Amityville. Let alone in that house. Right. It's like a haunted lamp or it's something. A, yeah, a haunted, creepy, anthropomorphic type tree lamp. It's a total scream. <laughs> it's a really bad movie. The scene in the basement with the chainsaw. <laughs> oh God. Anyway. You, you guys you... should watch it. We'll put a we'll we'll put a link in the uh in the attic to where you can see this abomination of a movie but i strongly recommend watching the rift tracks version yeah, you know the yeah, guys yeah. that brought you mystery science theater, theater 3000 mm-hmm. because there's no better way to watch a bad movie than with yeah, those yeah. guys so anyway all that said now why is this such an enduring story there have been more attacks against the credulity mm-hmm. of the story out of the lutzes than there have been sequels mm-hmm. and and uh, movies in the franchise mm-hmm a lot of that is justifiably so, I think. Yeah. Um, but also I think some of it is unfounded. And I, I'm just going to put myself out there now and say that I don't believe I, – I, I believe both ways. I don't believe that it was this horrifically haunted house, you know, that the book or the movie – uh, depicts, but I also don't believe the the conspiracy theories about how the Lutzes were broke and they were money grabbing and and all this stuff. Uh, I think that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I think they probably did experience something, whether it was a haunting in the true sense of it, or whether it was just them being afraid of the decision that they had made to live in a haunted house, you know, playing with their mind. But, uh, yeah. Well, we, I think um, some people have said, and I think you and I talked about this once, maybe they decided, oh, yeah, it's been said that they decided they couldn't afford the house. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like that because it makes me laugh because they lived in the house for 28 days. When you, I don't know if you've ever bought a house, but when you buy a house, you don't typically need to make even your first payment for, what is it, two, three months, something like that? That's the way it is now. 
I can't I don't imagine know. it was a whole lot different back then. Yeah, it's unless kind of, it's they like had when you buy a car, you know, it's like when you want your first payment. Different type of loan. But even then, let's say that they did have to make a payment right off the bat. A, a house with that kind of a, a payment and uh, George was apparently a pretty well employed or self employed or whatever. He he did well for himself. They had both sold a house. So I they, assume they had a, according to him, and I guess that's the big according to, but they had like forty thousand dollars each, or but even between the two of them, they did a twenty thousand dollar down payment. Yeah. And so a twenty thousand dollar down payment on an eighty thousand dollar house is you know, means your house payment is based on a sixty thousand dollars. So that casts that into doubt. A lot of doubt. That they however, I have Two okay. words for you to consider. And, and but just real quick, if you're going to say, oh, oops, looks like we can't afford this house anyway, better cut and run, you're probably going to wait until the bank comes knocking on the door asking where their payment is. You're not going to well, yeah. do it like- It was like August of 76. A week that they... before your first payment is even due. Right. However, two words for you. Okay. Property taxes. Oh, for real. And we're talking New York. Yeah, it's true. For a minute there, Vince and I looked at houses in New York State all over, and we were like, wow, beautiful houses. Why is it so cheap to live in New York? Oh, because your property tax can be almost as much as your mortgage. Yeah. Like, like we're talking like $600 a month or or more. And so, yeah, I get that. But still... Not after 28 days. And they were coming from another place in New York, right? Yeah, it's right? not like they, I, they had no experience. This wasn't out of the blue for yeah. them. Yeah, that was just the thing that I thought to myself. I thought, what, what, yeah. if, they, what if they found out? Because it's December, right? Mm -hmm. And if they bought in December, don't they have to pay the property taxes by the end of the year? And they're like, oh my God. Yeah. It's like, what, like $15,000. We don't have that money. But the thing is that... It's not a sure thing. Even back then, mm -hmm. it was not a sure thing that they could claim, oh, this house is haunted and we're out of here. Yeah. And now we're going to go get a book and movie deal. Yeah. It's not like today where, you know, everybody's handing out book and movie deals for for the most ridiculous haunted house stories, you know, ever. That wasn't really a thing back then. And certainly franchising wasn't a thing especially for horror movies yeah and there weren't a lot of people writing a book and then immediately getting that book turned into blockbuster movies i mean sure you could you could strike for that today even even with people handing it out left and right and the chances of it happening you know, Vince already said lightning in a bottle. It would be lightning in a bottle. And back then, things like that just didn't happen. So you're gunning for something that is unheard of. So I don't, I don't buy that. Oh, well, we're going to just buy this house and turn it into a blockbuster money-making scheme. Didn't they say they made something like $100,000, $200,000, like all told? But in the process, it destroyed their lives and it destroyed their families. So that's something that you can put in your pocket, take out, chew on it for a while. Ugh. Think why would why would these people do that? Right. And I think a lot of people believe that if you write a book, you're going to make a million dollars. Oh yeah. I'm here to tell you that's not the case. Right. The, ca the, the case is that you're not going to make a million dollars when you write a book. You're probably going to lose money. And with that said, that's not enough to convince me mm -mm. that they were necessarily making this stuff up. What I, what I think is interesting about this, like I said, is the fact that there are more questions about the validity of the story. Yeah. And for me, honestly, one of the most fascinating parts of the story is to consider that it is a hoax. Yeah. Because it was the perfect hoax. It was brilliant. Yeah. And I think that especially nowadays, there's an artistry in hoaxing. <laughs> and um, one of the things that the Lutzes did 
successfully was that until their dying days. Yeah. Uh, and even through a divorce. Yeah. Even through a divorce that they, they kept to their story. And, and they, they didn't insisted. turn on each other at all and say, oh, it was his idea or her idea or, yeah. They insisted that it happened until the day they died. Um, and they stuck by their story. Yeah. Of course, it, it just makes me think a lot. You know, I've heard it said that we are living in the post-truth era. Mm-hmm. But just because that happened 50 years ago doesn't mean that we weren't already living in that post-truth era. And who's to say that we haven't always been living <laughs> in that sort of place where if you tell a lie long enough, it becomes the truth. It becomes to you. the truth to you yeah. and to whoever it is that wants to believe it. Right. And I think in a way, that's why the Amityville story still resounds yeah. despite all of the evidence to the contrary that the people who moved in afterwards have not experienced anything like that. Numerous people have lived in that house since and ha- nobody has reported anything. There are lots of things that, you know, can poke holes in their story. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, there's 27 movies made of it, and even me, to a certain extent. If I had an opportunity to go in that house, I would get, I'd be creeped out. Yeah, and not because necessarily because of the murders that occurred there, but because of the the story, uh, because of the lore. Yeah, that seems that that I would imagine it's like soaked into the walls. Right. But that's just an outsider's perspective. I'm sure the people who live there are thinking this is just our house, rolling their eyes every time they. <laughs> <laughs> the right. the word yeah but uh speaking of a holes poke there were a couple pins that we put into topics that um maybe we can circle back to real quick yes um you mentioned the red room that wasn't on the plans for the house and nobody knows what it was for right there was that what was it it wasn't City Confidential. What was the interview where or the there was a guy being interviewed who was a childhood friend of of the the DeFeo kids, and he said that oh yeah that room in the basement it was a playroom, and I know exactly why it was red. <laughs> he said that uh, the DeFeo father one day plopped down a can of red paint because that was the paint that they had. And he said, hey, go paint that room. It's your playroom. And so the kids went and they painted the room red and they probably did a really crappy job because they're little kids <laughs> painting a room red and that it was actually on the house plans. It wasn't buried in the wall like in the movie. It was it was a little room. Very innocuous. It's like yeah. a, a storage room for toys. Yeah. And also... I saw a segment of that TV show, That's Incredible, Mm -hmm. that talked about this very thing we're talking about. They were not talking about the Amityville horror as an occurrence, but as as a hoax. They were interviewing the people who bought the house after after the Lutzes moved out. And I think they bought the house after the Lutzes moved out, but before the book and movie came out. So they were pissed, Mm -hmm. and and rightfully so, that that their new wonderful house suddenly became a tourist attraction for a bunch of nuts. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, people were literally coming onto the property and trying to rip shingles and bricks and stuff off of the house to take as souvenirs. One interesting thing that I, that I learned from that, that's incredible Mm -hmm. segment was that the people who bought the house had a history with the house that they had had family who lived there in the past who had owned the house. Mm. And so they were kind of buying the house back. It was a part of their lives in the past. And they were kind of buying the house back, maybe kind of bringing family back to it. Yeah. You know, f- familial vibes and that kind of, you know, good juju, I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah. And um, on the show, they interviewed their daughter, who I think was a friend of the youngest DeFeo daughter. Mm-hmm. And the camera followed her down into the basement, and she said, "This is the red room." And she climbed in, mm-hmm. and the camera followed her, and she said, "This is just a playroom, uh, a, a place to store the toys." And I used to come here before mm-hmm. um, and play here. There's nothing here. Yeah. So they were basically trying to um, trying to for the cameras debunk 
everything, including the the story about the front door getting blown off its hinges and the and yeah. the windows breaking. They were showing this is the original door here. There's nothing, yeah. nothing like that happened. Now will you please all go away? Of right. course, that didn't happen. They eventually sold the house in in eighty seven. I think after they had to rent it out. Uh, because they couldn't live there anymore. Right. If just for the what was it the woman said that she came outside after the the book or the movie had come out and on the the street there in front of the house there were she said literally 30 tour buses. Like yeah. buses of tourists just lining the street. And then like on New Year's Eve that people were driving their cars over the lawn just completely uh and they, they were the people who campaign with the city to get the address changed, the number changed, even though that didn't really do anything. Because yeah. now everybody knows what the address is. Right. But either way... Changed the windows and everything. They did. They changed the outward appearance of the house, the the creepy the creepy window eyes. Yeah. So aside from that, there are other little things here and there that indicate that there may have been a lot of fabrication, or at least some fabrication in the book. Mm-hmm. For example, the cloven hoof hoof marks outside their house, they said that it happened on New Year's Eve. And that was refuted by researchers who discovered that there hadn't been any significant snowfall during that time period. So, I mean, that's something, right? Yeah, I mean, unless the hoof prints were in mud or... I mean, did they specifically say it was in the snow? They said it was in the snow. Mm-hmm. George Lutz said that Father Pecorero came to bless the house on the day of the closing and that he saw him briefly. Pecorero has, is somebody that has not been easy to track down. Mm-hmm. He's never really given any interviews except for an interview in, in profile with his face hidden for In Search Of. So we don't even know for sure that this guy exists. Not really. It says that Pecorero signed an affidavit in the late 70s. Because there was a there was a um, a lawsuit between William Weber and the Lutzes, and this father had to testify. At least he had to sign an affidavit, and he said in his affidavit that the only contact that he'd had with the Lutzes in regards to the house was by phone. Interesting. Other accounts indicate he did bless the house, but nothing happened. Maybe it was over the phone. Then, on that in search of episode I mentioned. Pecorero or someone claiming to be him and appearing in shadow Mm -hmm. said that he did bless the house. And while he was there, he said he was slapped by an unseen hand and heard a disembodied voice telling him to get out. Is that before or after he saw the movie? After. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, that would make sense. Also, I notice these are some things that I've noticed. The details that the Lutz has mentioned in the book years later were heavily watered down when they talked about him. Mm-hmm. In an interview that she did on the 700 Club, of all places, <laughs> Kathy Lutz, what? she was talking about the uh, the fly situation. You know, yeah. the flies would be in this one room, the sewing room. Yeah. And in the, in the book, in the movie, they make it look like 10,000 flies. Yeah. And she said there would be between, quote, 30 to 40 house flies in one room. Uh-huh. 30 That's- to 40 house flies is a lot. Yeah, but it's not 10,000. But it's not like a 1,000 of them. Yeah. Um, So it almost seems like there's already an exaggeration happening there. And you can get that many, well, I guess maybe not in December. I was going to say you can get that many just from leaving a door open. But, you know, they also had a dog. Mm Mm-hmm. And dogs bring house flies in. I mean, who knows that but poor Harry dog wasn't I'm kidding. going was around and making messes. <laughs> I remember hearing- Poor Harry. Hearing George Lutz talk about these horrible smells in the basement. I'm thinking, well, maybe the dog was- found Part himself boxer. A- <laughs> Part boxer, definitely farting all over the place. But also yeah. maybe he found himself a corner and decided to start, you know, crapping and burying it or something. I don't know. Yeah. That's, it's always possible. In the interview that- George Lutz did with Art Bell in 2001. George Lutz himself said that the movie was very Hollywood. Yeah. You know, he said, as for the supernatural events, he said, quote, it didn't happen all at once. When I think back on it now, I think my perception of it is different than it actually happened at the time. He claimed that there was nightly occurrences of noises, smells, Kathy being touched, and Missy having an imaginary friend. Mm -hmm. But... He never really mentioned anything that was too outlandish. Right. And kind of 
leaned heavily on, well, Hollywood really, you know, did a number with that movie. And while it would have been easier for him to just say, oh, yeah, it all, it all happened. Um, just hearing him say that, it made me, I was became of two minds of the whole thing. Yeah. I thought, well, maybe something did happen. And this whole Hollywood thing got out of control and they kind of had to stick by the story. But it really wasn't that bad. Yeah, I kind of. I I kind of feel that way that I definitely think that it's possible like I said that something happened but not to the Hollywood level that was depicted in the movie. Um I do feel like the majority of it is, you know, a, a BS story. Whoever is responsible for that BS, you know, uh I don't know, but the one thing that gives me pause about the way that I feel and have felt about the Amityville story is the documentary that we saw, uh, My Amityville Horror, which is, uh, which Lutz boy is it? It was in, it was Daniel. Daniel Lutz. As an adult in 2012. And he, yeah, there was a movie called My Amityville Horror, which is basically Daniel Lutz telling his version of the events. Yeah, and I find I find that really compelling for a couple of reasons. First of all, he absolutely hated hates to this day, I'm sure, George Lutz. Absolutely hates him. Talks about how he was a devil worshipper and all this stuff. And so I find it hard to believe that if this was something that the Lutzes had concocted as a money-making scheme that this kid who absolutely hated him and had physical confrontations with him, that he would back up his story. So, and, but the other thing about Miamityville, if you haven't seen it, you've, you have to see it. No matter how you feel about this story, you have to see it. The the other thing about it that gives me pause is his version of the events are not mild at all. They are just as Hollywood, I think, as the movie, don't you think? In a lot of ways. You know, for, for a very long time, I believed that the Amityville horror was a hoax. Uh-huh. And I was fascinated by it because it was a hoax. And I and I like I said before. The idea that somebody concocted this story and it not only made a good movie and a book, but it became, it's become part of the fabric of paranormal yeah. in the United States. Mm-hmm. Everybody who was alive today or who was alive back then mm-hmm. was witness to the creation of a myth, a great American myth. Yeah. In 200 years. Amityville Horror is going to be, I think, one of probably two paranormal myths that took place in the 20th century that yeah. people are going to talk about. What's the other one? I don't know. Oh, I don't okay. know what the other one is. But I I think that that's going to be at the very top. People are going to still remember the Amityville Horror mm-hmm. in a couple of hundred years if people are still around and people are still... <laughs> Uh, you if know, people are that got grim. If people are still of a mind to think for about a horror like, podcast, things just got real grim. <laughs> so the, I'm just absolutely fascinated by that. That that we have been witness to the the creation of a myth that is probably going to evolve and change as the decades go by. When there's no longer anybody around who knew anybody. Uh, or, you know, when the records are lost and buried, people are going to be telling stories about the Amityville horror that have, have no semblance to even the Hollywood movie or the 27 different sequels that came out. You know, I just had a thought. You were asking, why is it so enduring? And I bet that one of the reasons is because of the, the, the contradictory uh, association that the name Amityville has taken on. You know, had it been, you know, Buffalo, New York, it wouldn't be the Buffalo Horror, <laughs> you know, and I don't, and even if it were, I don't think that it would be quite as catchy or as enduring. But Amityville, the friendly town horror, you know, it's that, 
that dichotomy. Anyway. I think there's something to be said there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so all of that, I was that I was talking about it. I was convinced that it was a hoax and I thought it was a genius hoax and all that stuff. And I thought, you know, George Lutz was a genius. And then we saw my medieval horror. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, it was real. <laughs> yeah. I was expecting the guy to come out and say, yeah, it was all just a it bunch was of- It was fake. George did it. And yeah. Yeah. And maybe tell a story about how he was abused or something. That That's his Amityville horror, you know. Right. But he um, retold certain events, especially the, the event with the window smashing his fingers. And there's a really, there's a really chilling segment where he's telling the story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just got goosebumps on my scalp because I know what's coming. He, well, he's having trouble telling the story because he's kind of getting agitated and he's freaking himself out. He's telling the 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 director saying i you know i i don't want to say this so i'm just going to come out and say it this is what happened you know and he he talks about uh his, being at the kitchen table with his mother well it was after his hand got slammed in the window right and they were they were they putting were bandaging ice on bandaging it and icing it yeah basically he said that they were sitting there on the ki- on the kitchen table tending mending his his wounded hands and they looked over and there was a spirit there and the spirit No, like the back door opened and shut, like something had come into the room. The back door opened and a spirit entered and it passed through his hands. Yeah. Sat down in the nook there with them and when they looked down back down to his hands, his hands were back to normal again. Yeah, they were fine. And then the ghost was gone. But the way he tells it is really chilling. He's very, very convincing. Very convincing. His take on the story was that George Lutz was a practitioner of black magic. Mm-hmm. He had telekinetic powers. He could levitate things. Mm-hmm. And that he was also like, you know, uh, physically and uh, emotionally abusive. Mm-hmm. And the kid hated him and he wanted his mom to leave him and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that really put a a new spin on it. I was like, there's something that George Lutz wouldn't want to cop to. Right. He wouldn't want to cop to saying, well, okay, I made the story up. We made the story up about the, how things happen because really I'm a witch and then people would freak out even worse. Right. I can see that. I can see that happening. And so that it added a new dimension to the Amityville horror uh, mythos for me until we watched it again. Oh, really? Just the other day? We watched it the other day, my Amityville horror in preparation for this. Uh huh. I don't buy it. <gasps> what changed? Well, I think it was something that was that I was thinking about the whole time we were originally watching the Amityville Horror the first time, the my Amityville Horror the first time around was that this guy's very convincing, but he has had forty some odd years to get his story straight. Yeah, if you have forty some odd years of telling people, because you know he talked about growing up being the Amityville kid. Yeah, he had to have played that to his advantage at some point to freak people out, to make friends, to get girlfriends, or maybe you just. Own it because, like Tyrion Lannister said, own what you are because then they can't hurt you, you know? Uh, Maybe he was like, all right, fine, it did happen, and I'm, you know, if if I'm going to be known for this, then... Well, he didn't tell his story until after his mother was dead and after George Luss was dead. Really? This was in 2012, and... I didn't realize that. The uh, the Lutzes died within a year of each other in, yeah. in 2005 and six. Yeah. You know, I mean, he seems like um, a really bitter, kind of angry. Very bitter and angry, yes. And I wouldn't put it past him. I wouldn't blame him if he said, you know what? Now it's my turn to get a little something off of maybe, this. Maybe, yeah. Maybe somebody will make this documentary and maybe MGM or 20th Century Fox will buy my life rights. And if somebody buys my life rights and wants to tell my story, maybe he'll end up making $600,000 as opposed to the $300,000 yeah. that his parents made or that the Lutzes made. Of course, I don't want to 
presume to know anything about these guys, their, their motivations or anything like that. I'm just saying that after I saw my Amityville Horror this last time, I saw, I understood, first of all, why he would want to tell this story because now it's his story. Right. His story was different. And yeah. also, of course, he would have to be a really, really good liar to be able to tell a story like that. But he lived with George Lutz. I mean, he <laughs> right. like learned from the best. <laughs> right. If George Lutz was one of the most convincing people telling the story that I've ever heard, I mean, it, it's almost like I, I don't want to disbelieve him. He's that good. Yeah. At insisting the story was was real. And it's just, it's a really fascinating subject, I think. And um, and I don't think we're through with the, with the story. I think it's going to, no, I think there's going to be developments in the future. Um, and I look forward to those things because it's just something that I've been fascinated with since I was a kid. Yeah. So alas, here we are. What do you think about the Amityville horror? Was there any truth to it? You know, there were also stories about it being the house having been built on Indian burial ground, which was also another thing that was refuted by Mm -hmm. local Native American tribes. They're saying, no, there was no burial grounds in that area. I mean, there's no end to the wacky stories that are connected to this, including the fact that one thing I forgot to mention was that in his interview with Art Bell, George Lutz said that Father Pecorero told him that the Archdiocese of the Catholic Church knew about the house. Mm. They knew that things had gone on when the DeFeos were there. What? The DeFeos had had masses said there, which may very well have triggered what went on for them, just like having the house blessed did for the Lutzes. The church has denied the existence of evil in the house, of course. So now there's even thrown into the mix there that it's something that the, the, the church was well aware that there was something in the house even before the murders took place. Hmm, I've not heard that. So, you know, this this can go on and on forever. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and the farther it goes, the the longer it goes on, the more that the people involved die. And, you know, I think we have passed the point where we can ever hope to have a definitive answer one way or the other. You know, I just, I, I don't think that... That'll ever happen at this point. You're right. I think that the majority of people believe it was a hoax. Mm-hmm. But I think there is a, a large faction of people that maybe even myself included that want to believe that it was real. Yeah. Anyway, I'd be interested in hearing what uh, the listeners yeah. think, uh, what visitors to the Castle of Spirits website think about the Amityville horror. Let yeah. us know. Is it a hoax? Do you believe it completely? Have you ever been inside the house? Have you lived in the house? Whatever you have about the Amityville Horror, be it experience or uh, opinion, let us know. Go to castleofspirits.com slash lounge and let us know there. And if you have a full-fledged story about Amityville that you'd like to share, then you can do so. You can do it through the lounge. We can move it over into the stories. Or you can go to the Submit a Story page on the website and tell us there too. Either one works. Uh, But yeah, join in the conversation. And I think everybody has heard of Amityville and the vast majority of us have opinions about it. So let's hear what yours are. And maybe we'll share some of those on our next episode. What? What's that noise? Oh, you hear that? Oh my gosh. At first I thought it was my phone ringing. I haven't heard this music in a while. I think that's the music that's telling us that it is time to bring this episode of Castle of Spirits podcast to a close. I wonder where that music comes from. Have you figured that out yet? The ether. The ether. I looked it up online. The ether is the place where all things that make no sense come from. All things ethereal. Ethereal. Ah, I get it. Ah, uh, and that makes sense. All right. Well, we better go because I think if we are still talking when the music stops, then we automatically become ghosts. And I'm not into that today. So Definitely not. I'd rather be a ghost keeper than a kept ghost. 100%. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will be haunting you very soon. Stay scared. <laughs> <laughs>